Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Allison Shaver. I am the past chair of TOPS. I am from Plymouth, Massachusetts. And this is um, Jennifer Slish. She is the current chair of TOPS. She teaches in Olathe, Kansas. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulty, still waiting for Dr. Zimbardo to um, be able to log on, but we didn't want to keep you waiting too long. So I'm going to go ahead and read my introduction um, in hopes that when I'm finished, he will be here. Um, so welcome to the first Tea with Tops. This event is possible with support from the APF David and Carol Myers Fund. We are honored to have Dr. Philip Zimbardo with us today. Dr. Zimbardo has been a pivotal leader in the field of psychology since his study, The Stanford Prison Experiment, was published in 1971. Earning his Master's of Science in 1955 and PhD in Psychology from Yale University in 1959, he then started his teaching career. From Yale to NYU to Columbia to Stanford, where he was for 50 years, and finally Palo Alto University, Dr. Zimbardo has always been an educator first. Like many of you, the Discovering Psychology series was a staple in my classroom. Much of what I know about psychology started with this series. Dr. Zimbardo's passion for understanding and explaining human behavior sparked an excitement in me, and for that, I would like to thank him. Dr. Zimbardo served as president of the APA in 2002, and he is currently the president of the Heroic Imagination Project, which teaches people how to overcome the tendency to watch and wait in a moment of crisis. He is still teaching us today. He has recently put together a six hour online course called Zimbardo Systematic Engagement, which centers around well being, diversity and inclusion, systematic engagement, social justice heroism, resilience, prejudice, the power of unjust situational forces and how to resist them, values congruence, growth mindset orientation, and sociocentrism. Dr. Zimbardo's willingness to continue to share his research and continue to educate us today on human behavior make him perfect for our first Tea with Tops. We will be recording this discussion today to share with Tops members who are not be able to join us. All right, so I'm gonna talk very quickly about my journey to inspiring heroism and training everyone to be everyday heroes. Uh, that's me with my Dr. Z shirt, but what you'll see later is I'm wearing my uh, uh, hero shirt, uh, wanting everybody to be an everyday hero. So how am I working to inspire everyone in the world to become everyday heroes? Um, and I open with this question. Now, I do a lot of teaching to high school students now um, uh, virtually. Uh, I usually do one a month to, uh, to students in Canada and all in San Francisco, everywhere. So I always begin with, these are the heroes that most of us had when we were kids or a lot of kids, a lot of students have now. And I say, th these, these should not be your heroes because you have something that none of these heroes have. Yes, they can fly, they can, uh, bullets bounce off, they can s swim underwater for endless time. But you have a brain, and none of these heroes <laughs> have a brain because they are the brain child of a cartoonist. Uh, and so the question is, the issue is, use your brain wisely and well. And one of the ways we're gonna use your brain is to help you see, learn how to become an everyday hero. So what is a hero? Um, there, there's many definitions, but for me, a hero acts on behalf of others in need, that you come to the aid of somebody in need, or you defend a moral cause. Now, it's different than altruism because there are some risk, risk to life and limb. Uh, if you're a whistleblower, uh, it could affect your finances or your career. The problem with doing research on heroism, heroes are almost always modest and humble, and they disown the hero label. They say, oh, I did what anyone could do. But for me, it's moral courage is at the core of heroic action, whereas uh, military heroes, it's bravery uh, at the core of their action. So my con new conception of heroes is three Ds. 
democratize, demystify, diffuse. Democratize, anyone could be a hero, and you'll see later on. We typically think, uh, from, from, even from the time of you know, Greek myths, it's almost always been men. And I'm gonna show you that more often these days, it's women who are heroes, and I will give three examples. Uh, secondly, demystify. You don't have to have any special inequalities or you know, come from a certain kind of family. And the other thing I'm promoting is away from the notion of a solo hero to diffuse, to heroes in teams, heroes in ensemble, ensembles, working in pro-social networks. And again, I'll give some examples of those. So why do we need heroes? Heroes shift the norm from passive compliance to pro-social action. True heroes put their best selves forward in service to humanity. And they represent ideals that we can all aspire to. Heroes are the force of good that opposes evil in its, all its many forms. Both perpetrators of evil of action and the evil of inaction revealed in public apathy and indifference. So heroes are usually, as I said, ordinary, everyday people. It's their actions that are extraordinary. Heroism creates a positive ripple effect. When you do something that people see, it's a posit positive, it's a positive ripple effect. On the other hand, when you do something that people see that's negative, like crossing against a red light or smoking in public, you create a negative ripple effect. So I interviewed President Obama uh, when he first got into office eight years ago, and I asked him a simple question, are heroes special people? And here's an amazing answer. Uh, uh, this piece is like one minute and 30 seconds, and I want you to think of... You know, uh, what's remarkable about uh, history is uh, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, you know, last year Rosa Parks passed away, uh, and you know, I, I remember sitting on this stage with world leaders and Bill Clinton and senators and governors, and, and thinking uh, we were all paying homage to a seamstress uh, who had transformed the country and, and helped transform the world. Uh, you know, we we never know sort of how our actions are going to ripple. Ripple, ripple, there it is. Time. Uh, but each of us can take some responsibility for making sure that uh, we are pushing a little bit in the direction of justice and, and the direction of equality and the direction of tolerance. And, uh, when we do that, uh, uh, we may surprise ourselves with the amount of influence that in fact we have just by standing up or speaking up. You stole my line, standing up and speaking out. So who is Rosa Parks? Rosa Parks was a seamstress working in Atlanta, Georgia. And there she is with um, Martin Luther King next to her. Uh, and she made, made or fixed dresses for rich white women. Uh, and she um, uh, uh, typically rode a bus to, to get to work, to, to, go, to go visit these white women to, to fix their dresses. Uh, and one day she decided she was she was not going to uh, get up. Now, black people had to go to the back of the bus to get in. That's something I, I learned only recently uh, by a letter that, that uh, I got recently from somebody uh, who she had written to. And today, in this day, she said, I'm not, getting up to, uh, I'm not getting up to give my seat to a white person. Bus driver stopped, called the police. They put her in jail. And this is a picture of her, pr prison at 7053. But then, um, uh, the, uh, that, that instance, because they put her in jail, that became a starting point uh, for a civil rights movement that ended with the desegregation of trains and buses throughout the United States. So here's one woman who decided to stand, uh, not, to sit, not to stand up, to sit down in, in a white person's seat that changed the world. Now here's another female, here's two more female heroes, Irina Sendler, uh, she's a Polish survivor. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me, here, here she is. Uh, she saved 2,500 Jewish children from sure death. The Nazis put all um, Jews, uh, 400,000 of them or more, in a ghetto, a 10 foot walled uh, ghetto in Warsaw uh, with a minimal, uh, Oh, I think 250 calories a day. So children, old people would die and whoever survived, they would take the concentration camps. So uh, she was a social worker and uh, she, she organized a group of 
20 people, 19 women and one man, uh, they figured in, they found an underground sewer. They would smuggle these children out one by one uh, uh, to safety. And now more than 10,000 uh, Jews around the world owe their life to this woman and her bravery. Now, in fact, she was caught once and was brutally beaten uh, to death, uh, but br brutally beaten, but not to death. She survived. Uh, and so there is a powerful ripple effect. Uh, the other person who I, I see as a hero is uh, Christina Maslach. Um, she was the person who got me to stop the prison study. Not by saying you must stop, but just to say, realize that you have been changed by your experiment. Uh, and the mistake I made, I think it anticipates one of the questions is to be not only the principal investigator, but I became the superintendent. I, it was a role I took, which was a mistake. Because if you're the superintendent of a prison, you care more about guards and prisoners, and you care about the longevity of your institution. So I should have ended the study after the second day, I mean, after the second prisoner broke down. But I was caught up in the role of superintendent, trying to keep, keep my prison going and going. So I think here's a little presentation of a dialogue between us. Fifth day of the study. Zimbardo invited his girlfriend, recent psychology graduate, Christina Maslach, to visit the Lock Prison. I had heard bits and pieces uh, from Phil uh, about what was going on. And then when I was down there that evening, it really was kind of a wow. The thing that really got to me was when some of the guards took the prisoners down the hall to the men's room. She looks out and sees a line of prisoners with paper bags over their heads, each one holding on one shoulder. And they're leading him down the hall. And Phil comes over and I lock, lock, you know, my God, look at that. And I looked up and something about it just, you know, again, it was the dehumanizing, demeaning kind of treatment. I just, I couldn't watch it. And she said, it's terrible what you're doing to those boys. And she got tears in her eyes. I said, what? And she runs out. And I'm furious. I'm saying, you know, I'm saying, look, this is, you know, I run outside, I have this big argument. I'm saying, look, this is, this is dynamics of human behavior. Look, it's fascinating, the power of the situation. Mm -hmm. all. So I'm giving her all the psychological basis and what kind of psychologist are you? You don't appreciate this. Um, and she said, I don't understand. You're a stranger to me. I don't understand this. How could you not see what I see? I mean, you know, you're a caring, compassionate person. I know you from all the other things. Something's gone wrong here. And then the next thing she said, which had an equally big impact, is, um, you know, I'm not sure I want to, you know, have anything to do with you if this is the real you. And that was like a slap in the face because what she was saying is, you've changed. You know, the power of the situation has transformed you from, from the person I thought I knew to this person that I don't know. And at that moment, I said, wow, you're right. we got to end it. After only six days, Dr. Zimbardo shut down his experiment. So the question is, what, what, how did I deal with this heroic challenger? I married her the next year, uh, and uh, our anniversary is August the 10th, and we actually got married in the Stanford Chapel. Uh, and so that's Christina Maslach, now Zimbardo. Uh, so since then, I've given up evil, no more dining in hell. Uh, for the rest of my life, I'll only promote goodness and heroism in my new, hopefully, long life, although I'm 87. Uh, so that life is going to be short, but hopefully active. So uh, I created the Heroic Imagination Project, or HIP. It's a nonprofit San Francisco-based organization that trains people to take effective action in challenging situations. So this looks like a job for Superwoman, as you can see in this uh, wonderful image. Uh, and so here's the new logo, uh, HIP. Uh, and as you'll see, the I is the symbol of Psi. Uh, so we just designed that, that, that new symbol, Heroic Imagination Project. So uh, inspired by the Heroic Imagination, each of us, HIP designs innovative strategies that combine psychological research, intervention education, and social activism to create everyday heroes equipped to solve local and global problems. One of the main things we're focusing on now is on climate change that people have been ignoring because of the uh, pandemic. Our new vision is to build a virtual platform that delivers HIPS new content directly to global customers, preparing them to heroically face challenges every day. So what we do as educators, 
um, I developed um, three lessons, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. And these lessons are basic social psychology and cognitive psychology pre presented in an interactive way. Uh, there are slides, there are videos, uh, Q&A, critical thinking skills. Um, uh, and each lesson is, is, goes about three or four hours. Uh, um, but uh, teachers can chunk those in shorter, in shorter periods. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so here's a cartoon that um, a, um, a Polish graduate student made of me after I, I gave a talk. And so it, it's uh, the other issue I pre always present when I say how much information you can present in a cartoon. So I'm always saying students who, who view this, who are uh, art, have art, uh, artistic background, learn how to be a cartoonist. They'll be, they'll be always at work for you. So uh, here uh, I introduce myself in the program, and I'm not. Sh and I think I think it also introduces our bi bystander lesson. So our three lessons are how to be an um, active bystander, um, how to develop a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset, and a, a new lesson is uh, uh, um, how to transform prejudice and 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 discrimination in understanding. Hello, I'm Phil Zimbardo, president and founder of the Heroic Imagination Project. Our main focus is promoting the idea that heroes are ordinary people who take extraordinary action in challenging situations in their lives. Effective heroes do the right thing when other people are doing the wrong thing or more often when they're doing nothing. And also to expose evil uh, in all of its many forms as a whistleblower. We believe heroism begins in the mind, begins with thinking about yourself as a hero, thinking about yourself as having an inner hero that we will help express through our lessons, our ways of rethinking the nature of good and evil. Transforming bystander apathy into heroic action. Bystander apathy is what characterizes what's known as the bystander effect. In emergency situations, the more people present, paradoxically, the less likely anyone's to help. That's called a bystander effect. It was generated many years ago by the brutal murder in New York City of the woman Kitty Genovese, where many people heard her screams and did nothing. As soon as one person helps, then in seconds, that help is expanded. Our message is be the one, be that person who ignores the social norm of doing nothing and creates a new social norm of doing something. So that's the beginning of that. So some of our other lessons, so uh, the, the one I just present is combating the bystander effect. I'll mention qu uh, quickly about growth mindset. This is the work of Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, uh, who's my colleague at Stanford. And then the new one is combating stereotype prejudice and discrimination. Um, so here's bystander effect in action. I think, I have to remember, uh, this was a video that I made in London, I was teaching in London uh, uh, at Liverpool Station, which is a very busy, very busy um, thoroughfare. And essentially, we set up we set up a video camera, and you'll see um, people. Uh, we had an actress pretending to be a young, well dressed, clearly not homeless, well dressed, uh, seeming to be unconscious. Our actress Ruth takes Peter's place. She's not a drunk but she's also not a city gent. How long before she gets help? Four minutes have passed and 34 people have passed. People don't really want to know that this hasn't got the time. Well, they have got the time, they just don't want to get involved. But it's more complicated than that. If the street were deserted, a passerby would probably go to the rescue. But these strangers have silently formed a temporary group with a rule. Don't help. This woman, for instance, has clearly spotted Ruth. But she conforms to the rule and does nothing. Watch what happens, though, when someone else helps. She suddenly finds herself in a different group with a new rule to help. You are here. Sure. That's the fortune's name. 
then I saw Chef C, she was breathing or not. And I looked around and I couldn't believe that no one had noticed her because there was a bloke sat there just absorbed in reading a newspaper. Okay, so, so, so for example, that is one of the video clips that is in the bystander uh, uh, program. Um, uh, I mean, bystander lesson. So, so for each lesson, there are objectives. I'm not going to read through all of these. So, but our bystander lesson encourages compassion, helping others in need, and also suppresses bullying. So it's recognizing your situation. What are the social psychological barriers to acting? Practice re, uh, responding mindfully and wisely. Make a plan. And then we always say, share what you have learned. At the end of every lesson, we say, what have you learned today that's, that's interesting and important? And then who will you share this with? And we, you, we, you make a commitment. Like, uh, if it was a student, they have like a little um, answer book. And, and then, you know, uh, promise that you will share this with your mother, your father, your girlfriend, boyfriend. Um, and, and then a growth mindset. So as I said, this is the work of Carol Dweck. And she has a, a, a very important small book called Mindsets. Um, and um, most of us have a fixed mindset, meaning we say about ourselves and other people, I'm good at A and I'm bad at B. Uh, women are, are, you know, uh, a good, uh, good artist, but, but not good in technology. Uh, black people are good at S and not good at the, So we have these fixed mindsets and they become they become self-fulfilling um, prophecies. Uh, once you so, so for example, it was me, uh, I'm good at words. I mean, I've written 60 books and 600 articles, and I'm not good at crossword puzzles. I never do crossword puzzles. Now, how could that be? Uh, because when I was young, uh, younger, uh, I was with a group of people and they were doing crossword puzzles, and they asked me, you know, uh, what, what did I think the answer was? and I couldn't come up with it, and they all laughed. Benito, after that, I, 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 then I said, I'm not good at crossword puzzles, which is a, it's a reason not to do it. Uh, so, so there's an example for all of us. A single, a single experience can lead you to develop a fixed mindset about I'm not good at this or that. And again, many, too many um, of us say we're not good at math, and typically you know, in, in high school or junior high school, a teacher asked a question, you couldn't come up with the answer right away, or other kids had their hand raised. And from that moment on, you say, I'm not good at math. And, and then that means you don't take math courses, and then you end up not being good at math. Um, so, so we teach you how to overcome negative self-talk and how to commit um, sharing the information. So our training sessions, uh, we help people take effective action. Uh, our programs are really designed now primarily for high school. We started in college, but they really focus mo mostly on high school. That's why I'm hoping many of you will begin to use it. Uh, and typically what, what we have done in the past is uh, uh, schools license our lessons, uh, each one for, like for a three-year license because we're always updating them. Uh, and then we typically have a, a trainer come to train all the teachers uh, in, a, in a cluster. But now we're trying to develop, put our lessons online uh, and have them available in it really inexpensively. Um, so we have pre-post measures showing it works. Uh, uh, inter there's a lot of information acquired. There's changes of attitude, changes of value. Uh, and we get this feedback from st to students, teachers, and parents. Uh, and we show that there's an increased uh, instance of leadership, compassion, teamwork, and actually, our prejudice lesson, we show re reduce, reduction in prejudice. So what can you do? So here it is. The power of one, be the one who helps and remember that your actions matter. Power of two, be an ally and support other day, everyday heroes who are doing the right thing. Create what I call now hero squads, uh, pro-social network of hero squads. Now this is, again, we talk about, we have a whole section on bullying, you know, it's when, when everybody in the class knows that there's a bully, what happens is individually becomes a bystander. Nobody does it. So you create a, a hero squad. A, a bunch of you get together and you confront the bully to say, we want you to stop, you know, bullying this kid or that kid, you know, or else, you know, we will take action as a group. And then we want change. Egocentrism is the enemy of heroism. 
Heroes are sociocentric. That is, heroes always are focused on what can I do to help somebody else. So we turn egocentric me into sociocentric we. So it's we, not me. It's us, not them. And then we say, every day your job is make somebody feel special. So you don't have to have somebody lying on the ground bleeding. It's make somebody feel special. When you meet somebody, learn their name, try, remember it, use a mnemonic, and then when you can, give it a genuine compliment about how they look, how they're dressed, uh, what they said. Uh, uh, and so our program uh, is on the west coast of the United States, in California, in Oregon, Arizona, Michigan. And unfortunately, I grew up in New York from the Bronx, uh, and we don't have a program in the east coast, so that's something I'm gonna have to rectify. But we are everywhere, we're in many places around the world, uh, including uh, even um, fascist countries like Budapest. Our most, uh, um, our most amazing program is in Budapest. It's called Hero Square. Uh, and I, I, I'm on the board of directors there. They have trained 10,000 high school teachers in every city throughout Hungary. Uh, and the 1,000 high schools, uh, and we follow, we follow up. Uh, and the people in Hungary have taken my lessons, obviously, and, and transformed them and built, built them out using uh, uh, Hungarian heroes, et cetera. Uh, we are in London. We are in Porto, Portugal. Uh, we, again, our program is big in, in Poland. <clears throat> uh, my family comes from Sicily, uh, and we, we're working in a ghetto in Palermo uh, with African migrants. I can tell you more about that later if you're interested. We are in Iran. Uh, uh, in Prague and in, in Bratislava, so literally a, around around the world. So with that, Dr. Z, thanks you for your caring and attention, and we are ready now. Uh, so if you want more information, go to heroicimagination.org, uh, get involved, um, and typically, here's what we say, and we're broke. Um, <laughs> uh, the problem with the pandemic is uh, n nobody can e afford any of our lessons uh, and nobody can afford to volunteer. So, uh, so with that, uh, I, I finish. Okay. okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. And again, you, this is all available for you to take this lesson and use it. I mean, the, what I just presented. Great. We appreciate that immensely. Lovely to see you, and we certainly appreciate you taking time out of your right. day to talk to us high school teachers about psychology. Um, we're gonna have some questions from some of the participants here. So, um, and I, I apologize in advance if I, you know, harm or slaughter anybody's name in the process of doing this, but Jeffrey D'Elia from Northern Highlands Regional High School in New Jersey wonders, how has the field of psychology evolved over the course of your career, Dr. Zimbardo? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I think in two ways, um, um, uh, uh, it's become more applied, um, uh, a focus on uh, applications in everyday life, like uh, peace psychology, um, uh, climate psychology, health psychology, all knew they were not there before. And again, in many cases, it was women psychologists who who triggered or started those those programs, um, and I think when I was president, I was president of the American Psychological Association back in 20, 2002. Two. Uh, yep. And one of the things I said was, we need more women teaching in psychology, uh, and more women playing significant roles. Uh, and I must say, I think for the last five years, all of the presidents of APA have been women. Uh, so, uh, so again, uh, given given that I have two daughters and, and and Christina as women all around me who are wonderful, uh, I, I've always promoted the role role of women in psychology. Um, so, so that's one change. The other big change has been in neuro neuropsychology, um, but that that's simply to make psychology more in quote scientific, um, and. Um, so I, I would say, you know, I would say the neuropsychology is one of the newest areas. Um, there is less, there is less formal experimentation now. 
you know, not only because um, it's it just more complicated to do experiments um, that, um, and and we don't we don't we don't see uh, it's, it's more demonstration studies or um, uh, analog studies. What do you think would happen if kind of thing? Um, so I think those are the changes. Okay, great, thank you. So Michael Dowdell from Grafton High School in Massachusetts is curious, what aspect of the Stanford Prison Experiment would you like to see us emphasize in our high school classrooms? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, it, well, to ask the class at the end, uh, what do you think, would it have been any different if they were all female, if it was all prisoners and guards were females? Now, we don't know. The conjecture is um, you certainly would not have had the physical uh, force, violence, uh, but you might have had more um, verbal, uh, verbal abuse. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is to make sure that the key message is the power of social situations to transform individual behavior. So the question is what happens when you put good people in a bad situation, the, if the bad situation is powerful enough, the good people are transformed. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and again, it's, it's um, typically now when I give my a talk about it, I always say at the end of talking about prison study, before I go on to say, take a moment, so what kind of prisoner would you have been? What kind of guard would you have been? What kind of um, superintendent of that prison would you have been? So make it very personal rather than here's this thing happening happening out there. Um, and as I said, the main change is I should have I should have played oh, I should have only been the the um, principal researcher and investigator and not not the superintendent of the prison. Also, we just underestimated what it is to do an experiment that doesn't stop. That it, the sure. study with me, two graduate students, one undergraduate. At any one time, one of the four of us is sleeping because the experiment goes all, that means there's only three people. At any one time, somebody has to go get food and bring it back. Uh, when a prisoner breaks down, uh, typically I uh, or the senior graduate student would have to take them to student health first before releasing them. So, uh, and then somebody, ha somebody is doing um, video videotaping, et cetera. Uh, we just were understaffed. You know, we should have had six people, eight people. You know, many, many more. Uh, uh, and and so I never left that. The, uh, the psychology department is called is named Jordan Hall. In fact, they're changing the name because they just realized Jordan was was a racist back in I don't know turn of the century. Oh. <laughs> yes. So so there's <laughs> a, a policy to change the name. Uh, but essentially, I had an office on the second floor, and I had a convertible cap, so I would sleep there. I mean, when, when it was my turn, I would go to sleep in the office. I never went home, because uh, my home was in San Francisco. So, so it's just an accumulation of stress. Uh, and I think that's, that's why I didn't make, why, I could have made wiser decisions. Sure, okay, thank you. That was an in-depth and personal answer. I feel like we got some insider information. Sure. <laughs> um, so Sabrina uh, Emke of Eviston Township High School in Illinois and Peter Smith in New Brunswick, Canada, both have similar questions about how you see the Stanford Prison Experiment today in connection with the defund the police and Black Lives Matter movements in uh, so many of our cities across the country. Yeah, I applaud the movements. And I mean, the most terrible thing is that Every day since in the last week, there have been instances of police abuse. I mean, it's as if the police have not seen the videos of other police, uh, you know, abusing citizens. Um, you know, in Portland, and uh, and and partly it's you know, I, what before I, before I try to make a connection with the prison study. I mean, nicely into our next question from Maggie May at Villa Joseph Marie High School in Pennsylvania. Um, have you noticed ways in which your research can be used to help explain human behavior during the pandemic? You know, we're all high school teachers well, waiting still, most of us, to figure out what is our job going to look like? So um, how has your research helped us? 
Huh, I don't know. Understand you, human I, behavior during the pandemic. Oh, yeah, that's a big leap. Um, um, or what have you noticed about human behavior and connections to psychology well, during um, this pandemic? It doesn't okay. have to be your research specific. No, no, the big issue is masks. <clears throat> um, so, um, in fact, I, I'll send you, with the, I mean, I started some while ago a, a program to get people to wear masks. I, I made a, <clears throat> um, a, a little insignia of, of uh, wear your mask, save a life. So I have a picture of a mask with that, that logo on it and also a board around it, which I will send to you. Uh, so, so, but now there are people who refuse to wear a mask, okay? Nothing could be simpler. And so many of them are saying, I'm, in, I'm an American, American's independent. We don't have to fight. And again, it was because for it say, when you go outside, you must wear a mask. And when you see any gathering, many, many people are not wearing masks. Uh, so Florida, the uh, coronavirus is out of control. They show people walking in the street, the news, or on a beach, and no one is wearing a mask. And again, so, so here's a case where a value of being independent as an individual, as supposedly this is America promotes independent thinking, Here's where independent thinking is wrong. It's got to be, this is where conformity is good. That wear a mask, save a life. Don't wear a mask, uh, uh, th uh, threaten, somebody's li threaten somebody's life. Um, so Kate uh, Trongel from East Lake High School in California is, has the question, what is the biggest issue we face as a society today that you believe can be changed in the next decade? Well, the biggest, forget the pandemic, but it's climate change. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the a climate change disaster is happening, you know, separately from the pandemic, but the pandemic gets all the news. So you don't see much news about it, uh, but um, if anything, uh, uh, there's new evidence that they are still um, burning forests in, 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 the, in Africa, in the Congo, uh, in, in Brazil. They're still destroying forests, uh, in logging um, that um, uh, certainly um, many governments are still being supported by uh, corporate money in um, <clears throat> coal, um, oil uh, manufacturers. So those are um, multi-billionaires who su whose money supports certainly uh, our government, but many other governments to keep, allowing them to keep doing what they're doing is polluting, polluting society. So, so there's now, one, one of the things we can do is starting a youth movement. Uh, so so e I, I, years ago, I talked about eco-heroes young people uh, who, uh, are, it's, it's, their neck, it's their world. So to be, to be an eco-hero, to start a movement. Now, my colleague at Stanford, Albert Bandura, wrote a paper uh, in the American, uh, American Psychologist, a, a recent one, that about why he thinks that youth have to be, the, it's youth that have to be the champions of environmental change. Uh, and um, I should, I don't have the reference to it, but I can get it. But it's Bandura and I think the woman's name is Lynn Cherry. It's, it's student, it's a student group. Uh, what is, I wish I had it. Okay. Um, it's it's a, a student group, a student headed group that are promoting uh, envir um, the importance of you know, environmental activism. Uh, in the family, in the neighborhood, in lo especially now in local governments. Yeah, I definitely think that the youth are gonna play a big role in, in where we're headed next. And they're, they're very active and, and want to be political, which yeah. you know sometimes we don't see, so that's exciting. No, but they have to, see, now political simply means taking action. So again, yes. 
it's, I mean, we, most academics have long been, you know, uh, for justice, for social justice, you know, uh, for uh, teaching about prejudice and discrimination, but we haven't transformed that into political action. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, we well, we want to say, uh, you know, science is not political, but, you know, but essentially the message, the message of science about good and, well, and the prison said it, good and evil has to be translated into political action. Act, it's political action that changes reality. It's not yeah. words, it's not ideas. Absolutely. And Bardo, I just Googled while you were um, talking, sorry. Um, yeah. It is Lynn Cherry who yes. wrote the article with um, Dr. Bandura. And if anyone wants to look this article up, it's called Enlisting the Power of Youth for Climate Change. And it was in the American Psychologist. That's what I saw. Okay, I got two, I got two of the things right there. Her Good name <laughs> and, and, and American Psychologist. Yeah. Perfect. Any, oh, the other problem is um, I'm actually doing a, um, an APA virtual um, lesson uh, with Bandura. <clears throat> Oh, I, th I think we, I think we, we, we got to get it together by Wednesday together, a piece which is mostly him talking about uh, youth with climate change and, and also a bunch of other things, why we have to transform self-efficacy into collective efficacy to make a change. And that will be part of the APA virtual conference? Yes, yeah. Oh, fantastic. Sure. So just so all the TOPS members know, it's it's fifteen dollars for us to have access to all of that, which is really amazing this year since it's all virtual. Yeah, and I, I again, I think everything is available for a year. I mean, yeah, I mean, for sure. I mean, I, certainly it's good if you're going to be lecturing online. You just you know, pull down the stuff and put it out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one last question for you. This comes okay. from Leslie DiStefano at St. John's Country Day School in Florida. And she's wondering if you have any suggestions on how to expose students to examples of diversity in psychology. I think so often our textbook is full of white yeah. men and the studies that they have done at the high school level. And so do you have any resources that you could point, give us or? Yeah. Um... Again, a Stanford colleague, Jennifer Eberhardt, who's African-American woman, uh, uh, has done work on implicit bias, I think a long time in the police, but it's Eberhardt, I think. Okay. Even, um, and uh, and uh, Claude Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E, -E -E, uh, both, both are colleagues at Stanford. Um, um, uh, so, yeah, the other thing is um, unconscious bias. That, that, that's a main topic, unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, now, I mean, the problem now with textbooks is um, uh, many publishers are not producing textbooks. Hard, co no, hard covers are gone. So sure. it's all online. So, so, um, um, it's it's hard to make changes, so um, I mean again, my t my textbook is core concepts in psychology, uh, and we have a whole a whole t long sections on discrimination and prejudice, and uh, so th there is a wealth of information online. Um, okay, do you have any? Go. I think you have great. Oh. What do you think? No, no, no. I, yeah, I'm saying I got it. I got it. Oh, you got to go. No, I have to go because I got to travel two hours to visit my son's family in Davis, California. Oh, good for you. We'll yeah. have so much fun. Um, we surely appreciate you doing this. Um, it was such an honor to speak with you. Okay. You're, you know, you're somebody that I've looked up to for quite a while. So thank you. Oh, thank um, you. And we so, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, and the, 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 the little presentation I made, again, you could take, take and use any, any or all of it. That's Great, and we're going to push out your um, your course to everyone. Oh, oh yeah, quickly. Let, well, so. let me mention the course. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> so it's I, I spent a year developing that course. It's um, I think six hours, six six one hour lessons, uh, 
and it's there is it's me sitting in front of my fireplace. We had a videographer come, and then talking about, you know, um, and, and, and part of the part of the overall thing is how to communicate effectively. It's the overall theme: how to be a good listener, how to be a good speaker, and then it's taking uh, whole lessons on stereotyping, on prejudice, uh, on the bystander. Uh, on um, like eight different topics in psychology that I go in, into deeply and slowly and clearly. Uh, and um, uh, you get five hours of continuing education credit for it, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is great. It's yeah. Palo Alto University where I was a I was when I, when I retired from Stanford, I taught there for about six, seven years. Uh, and so they they help uh, produce it, and they are, they are uh, making it available. Uh, and if you go online, I mean, the thing you get you can get a hundred dollar discount if when you go on just put in my name. But if ten or more uh, teachers do it together, they will add additional discounts. Okay, uh, great. So so, well, but thank I'm you very much. Is, I, I mean, I don't get I'm not getting anything fr from it. I I got I got paid to produce it. But yeah. what I'm saying, it's really, really top quality uh, and unique material. Yes. Well, we appreciate everything that you are willing to do for okay. high school and just psychology in general. And um, a lot of people in the chat are saying thank you and please oh, give our well nice. wishes. Oh, that's nice. Oh. To Dr. Um, Bandura, too, if you happen to speak with him. Okay. Great to talk to you. Enjoy your day. Okay.